This powerful theatre practice enables youngsters to have a much more powerful impact into the work, but of course you have to have theatre practitioners there to help you do it. What drama teachers do is they borrow that and they've got the skills to operate or operate not. If you're not a drama teacher, all you're doing is borrowing. So I hope that everybody in this room, wherever you're coming from, whichever orientation you have, can see that actually if you learn the skills together, and we learn the skills together, uh, it doesn't matter where we're from. And it's not about, I don't like drama, or I can't do drama, I've never done drama. But I bet you, you have taken a different point of view in your time. I bet you've had an author who's presented you with a different point of view that you've read through. I bet you've read someone who you hate. I hope this book gets it sometime in this book. I bet you have. I bet you've seen a play where you're looking at it and thinking, why do they play like that? Because it's about being able to take on a different point of view. But in a school, those of you who not come across my group yet, but you do it at a drop of a hat, and we'll be having a go at it, and it's the stuff that I've put it on. Me. Now, the three circles I've put up here, if they're making any sense so far, is really the sorts of arenas that we need to get our heads around and get some skill in. They're, in terms of the practice, we've got to know about drama for learning and the strategies that are drama and what drama for learning is. That's one thing we've got to get heads around. The national curriculum has a go at it in speaking and listening. Um, and John Needles, when he was supporting it, and uh, Paul Bunyan, they, they only got up, they only got four lines. You know, they wanted to put a whole book in, but they said, oh no, no, you can only get four lines on national curriculum of speaking and listening. You can't have any more than that. So they had to scrunch it all down. I heard uh, uh, a colleague this morning saying that uh, they had, uh, at an interview, they had to sum up in five words. Um, the whole of the world, so to speak, in, in terms of learning and teaching. It's very hard, isn't it? And to put that in the national curriculum, if you've read it, is very, very hard. But they, they, they had a go. They had a go. But it, you know, they could only do what they were allowed. So the drama for learning thing has just come out as sort of um, hot seating. You know. And people are like, yeah, hot seating, do they? A roll on the wall. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, conscience Alley. Yeah, we'll do that. Now, these are all strategies. And they're very useful strategies. But when you learn the technical aspects of drama, the conventions for dramatic action, which we'll have a look at today, there are 33 ways currently uh, in the research arena that Dr. Hefner brought out, there are 33 ways of representing a human being, because that's what theatre is about. Theatre is about, drama is about representing human beings, finding some way of representing them. How do you represent countries? May we hear the story that you were about to tell the wolf about the bear? Well, um, a few years ago, uh, we had a, a group of bears that got into a, a widely populated human area. Uh, and they started to raid the bins. The people were getting angry with this and they were going to shoot the bears. So we managed to transport the bears to a place where they'd be able to feast on animals rather than rubbish. And uh, they weren't at risk from the humans. We managed to do this peacefully and the bears are now half happy in conservation. Where the bears live now, there are no humans for miles and miles. And the bear population has actually increased. And uh, the bears weren't happy at the time. They, they, um, some of them had a face a bit like yours, you know, quite upset looking. But they don't look like that now. Because we've checked back in with them, and we've, we've kept checking, checking back in afterwards, just to make sure that everything's okay. Mm -hmm. So we promise, if you let us work with you, we won't just take you somewhere else and leave you. We'll make sure it's okay first. Mm -hmm. We do understand how you feel. And unfortunately, not every human feels the same way that we do about preserving your best interest, but that's genuinely what we want to do. Why don't you move the humans? Human uh, population is increasing constantly, year on year, and in the UK alone in the last five years, we've gone from like 54 
million people to 72 million people, and that's just going to keep on increasing it worldwide. And so rather than just saying it's not an issue and letting the wildlife go to pot, we want to um, conserve everything that we've got. Are those statistics correct? Well, that, when I was training about 10 years ago, the population was about 54 and now it's 70. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can see the constraint when placed on someone who can't respond, mm. that it actually breeds a possible response in us. Yeah. That if he could talk, I bet he would say, I bet he's thinking this at the moment. Is that happening to you or is it not? It's, it, you know, it's only accidental. But in terms of the dramatic conventions, which I'd just like to brush you past, the dramatic conventions create, and this is what Dorothy Hethke brought to us so many years ago that's taken a long time for us to understand. It's brought in this whole thing of linguistic exercises and linguistic parabolics, where your mind and the language that you have is squeezed into meaning, which again is why the outcome is always standards go in this way. And we've not found anything opposite so far because of what's squeezed in here. Now, I'll just ask a few people. Now, look, this is, this is you, don't, you can shake your head and say, don't ask me. But I'm just going to be asking a few people in this room if you can just think from this wolf's point of view <coughs> a response that he might currently have here. I don't feel it is our responsibility to um, make up for your mistakes with regards to birth control and population. Uh, if you insist on populating the world as you do, I do not see why we should suffer. You think you speak as your people. You are not our first people. Look at you, you sit on the floor. Look at the positions you hold. <coughs> should be going on in my head, i.e. how do I think this through, I could be so blooming moved that I'm going to have to say this out loud, that would be really mean, nobody can say But you just let this thing have its own bit of energy for a while, you don't need 30 kids to come, you just need enough, and if possible, it's an opportunity for those youngsters who have yet to come into the mainframe of this, however they see the mainframe of it, it gives them another opportunity to come in. It's not a demand. It's only if they want. And we will have children, I believe, who would want to stay longer in classrooms if they have opportunities for real choice. These humans, they're pretending they're friendly. I am one wolf. There are seven of them. They do not understand at all. the right to decide where we should go or how we should live. You can't possibly know how I feel. You're just trying to satisfy your own need to make yourselves feel better. It was very difficult because obviously I had no voice. All I had was my eyes. So that's why I started looking at people. Maybe that's why maybe you felt something now. I felt something. That was quite emotional for me. Yeah. And to bottle all that up and have other people speaking on, on my behalf. Difficult. But yeah, I mean, you, you got more or less to where I was. The reason I snorted at the bears, I thought it was better than the rats that you held. <laughs> I thought we'd at least move up the food chain. Yeah. That was our first gig. Yeah. <laughs> we did well. <laughs> I liked, what, I liked what the humans did, taking a lower position. I, it, it, I felt a bit more respectful towards them. That was a good move. Mm -hmm. Do 
people said things I, did, I, I didn't think at first, but yeah, it was good. Did you trust the human? That was powerful for me. Yeah. Did you trust them at all? Did I was beginning to, but then someone put a hand on my shoulder, especially the other human yeah. who turned. Mm. And I felt my power coming back. Yeah. You were beating me down. And then I, I felt a wolf again. Who, who, who moved you the most? Who moved After me? the humans who spoke, what was it that moved you the most? This lady here. The one who turned. Was that... Did anybody else do that? Mm. Especially when she wouldn't touch me. Because the work is able to touch us at the deepest places, because it is an art form. And we can't work out, hopefully, why, when she opened her mouth and said the word she said, why did the emotional vibe in this room go deep? What was it? See, for me and her foreign voice, it reminded me of my father, who was a Greek citric, coming over to England. I mean, I can get quite moved by it. But that's good. It should sometimes, the word should sometimes take us into an area where we get moved. Like a good film, like a good book, like a good piece of music. It's not just to sort of be music. It's music to move us. To help us be in the mood, change our mood, reflect our mood. And so in a classroom where we're looking at young boys who have yet to engage emotionally in almost anything because they're so battered by whatever, this is a classroom where you can let emotions have some reign. Not free reign, because you would want text, a walking text, like that on occasions, move children. But of course you will never ever have, unless you're very lucky, You'll never have, ever have eight or nine brilliantly gifted wolves in your classroom to create moments like that. Because remember, I was using it to illustrate to you the need in Mank of the Expert to build history, not to have the responsible team doing the job. But it's coming from somewhere. The responsible team here now has, can explain to a wolf its history of the jobs that we've done and the way that we want the wolf to perceive us because it's about the values. Now I'll ask the wolves now, not from wolf perspective, from your own perspective as a human being, in witnessing the one story, could you just outline any of the values and give us some evidence backing it, if you possibly could, that you felt expressed by that.